Show. Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia Online. My name is Jason Freeman. I'm a producer and editor here in the Free Library's Author Events Office, and I'm so pleased to be here tonight to introduce uh, our guest, Beth Kephart. Beth Kephart is the author of more than 30 books across a wide range of genres, including poetry, young adult fiction, and most notably, the memoir. These works include the award-winning How-To Guide, Handling the Truth, and Love, an Ode to All Things Philly. Uh, <laughs> that, one, that one had a very excellent hometown crowd, obviously. Uh, a, a writing professor at the University of Pennsylvania, Kephart is the recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Grant, a Pew Fellowship, the Speakeasy Poetry Prize, and is a National Book Award finalist, among other honors. Her essays have appeared in the New York Times, Salon, Brevity, and the Chicago Tribune, among many, many other places. Beth has also appeared on our stage as a guest author and interviewer of authors uh, several times. Uh, her new book is called Wife, Daughter, Self, a memoir and essays, composed of interlocking essays about travel, everyday miracles, and family. It's praised by Carolyn Forche as a shimmering book in which, quote, that most sought most elusive treasure is revealed, what it means to be human and aware. Tonight, Beth will be in conversation with Jacinda Barrett. Jacinda is an actress, an actor on Netflix's Bloodline, and also appeared in the films The Human Stain, Poseidon, and The Namesake, among many other movie and television roles. She is also a writer, mother, and as was my first encounter with her, one of the roommates on Real World season four in London. Always nice to have another Gen Xer in the house. Here to tell you more about this book, Beth, Jacinda, thank you both for being here and uh, take it away and I'll come back later and help you guys with Q&A. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And Jacinda, thank you so much for being here. I know I'm gonna cry if I say too much about how much you mean to me, how much it means to me that you said yes. Jacinda is an actor. She's all those things. She's a mother, but she's an incredible writer. She's a tremendous reader. And we have had some of the most uh, important to me conversations about literature. And so it's such a privilege to have you here with me. And I said, as we were talking and talking about what this night would be, that I would begin by reading the first four pages of the book. They are the pages that begin the wife section. So here we go. First a room, then two rooms, then a three room, three floor house, then two stores with a porch plopped along the railroad tracks, big enough to hold a child, just one child. Then another house that got fat with things until we counted what we needed and didn't need much of that. You are an artist, I am a writer, we'll make something, why not? I'll leave you alone when you want alone. I'll be near when near is better. At the breakfast table where the folded laundry spills on the floor in the purple light of the TV, in the bed sometimes. Beneath the scorch of stars by the canal where what I want for you is the blue heron, the slick turtle, the skin that the snake left, and where you say, how much farther will we walk? How many miles are we going? I order inexpensively, so do you. I cower for traditions, you neglect them. I burn my hand on the cast iron pan of the Valentine's Day risotto, and you feel the bowl with ice all through the night while the pain strikes the nerves like lightning theater. We are not Virginia and Leonard. We are not Zelda and F. Scott. We are not Georgia and Alfred, Frida and Diego, Lee and Jackson, Joan and John. Still, we are original because we are original. And because I cry at every wedding, imagining again the start of things, imagining the end, the grief preordained for one or the other of us, not that there haven't already been endings, not that we haven't already recovered. We knew to recover. We recovered for the sake of us. We told ourselves that we recovered for our son, but I am increasingly inclined toward honesty. We recovered for ourselves. That is beautiful. Um, well, I too, Beth, am honored to be here and ask you these questions. And um, it's a privilege for me because um, I met Beth, I'd say maybe five years ago, 
when I read her book, Handling the Truth, and I contacted her directly, <laughs> which was, I think, a little shocking to her, actually, and to me, because I hadn't done that before. Um, and I asked her if she would work with me as a teacher. And, um, and she agreed. And I still remember the first piece we worked on. Uh, you wanted to see how I was as a reader, so you gave me Waking Up Wild by Anne Gillard. Um, so it was interesting to me to talk to you about memoir, because obviously that's what we worked on together. Um, and in, in the book, there's a part where you write, memoir is the life wanting to be transform, transformed, and that memoir is the life we've been waiting for. And I wondered if you could elaborate on what that means to you. Um, and really, like, it's the life we've been waiting for. I was so interested in that. Yeah, well, there are many. Um... And by the way, the answer to the question, what kind of reader is Jacinda Barrett, one of the best around? Um, when we write memoir, we are not just transforming the page, we are transforming ourselves. We are remembering newly, remembering differently, looking at life from you know, all of its angles. And so the act of writing memoir transforms us, transforms our ideas of ourselves in the book where those words were, it is also that Bill, my husband and I had set out to create this small thing called Juncture Workshops. We were at a point in our lives where we really wanted to make sure that we had created meaning. Um, we brought our skills. Bill's an artist, I'm a writer, I've taught. Um, what can we make together? Not to change the world in a big way, but to leave something good behind. And so we created this juncture workshop and where that, uh, and we took people, you know, to places like a farm and uh, by the sea and by a river. Um, and so those lines have a double meaning because it's, it's the life waiting to be transformed. It's the life Bill and I built around memoir. Could we take this, this thing that I love, this thing that I have been, in my autodidact way, studying and trying to perfect and trying to teach for so many years, could we take that and transform our lives with it? And we found that we could. That's wonderful. Yeah, we have that in common that we both came to this thing of writing in sort of like a stumbling upon way because we love reading and we loved words. And, um, and yeah, before I work with you, I very much, you know, was teaching myself through reading books, as I know you did too. Um, I also feel like in reading your work and reading lots of your work and specifically in this book that you just seem to so easily or it appears easily embrace your fears. Mm. And um, I wondered if that was what propelled you, it, it, it's some of part of what propels you to write or it's excavated in the process of the writing what those fears are. And I'm sure it's different for every book, but in this book specifically. Yeah, this is a memoir in parts, a memoir in pieces. And so each piece comes from a different emotional place, but there are pieces like panic attack where I am propelled to write about what I'm afraid of, um, my panic, my anxiety, which are, which are real to me. Um, I find that if we begin in fear as a writer, we um, lean toward peace as we write. Um, and if we begin in a calm place as a writer, at least for me, I escalate towards anxiety. Because if I start in a peaceful place, a calm place, it's because I think I know the answers and it's because I think I know the story and okay, I can write that, no problem. But then I get into it and I think, I, I don't know the facts or someone else has a different point of view or maybe that's not where I should be going. And, and, and the trouble begins to build. So- it you. Pardon? It unmoors you as you yes, go. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, but, but maybe it's better. I don't know, just into how you feel about it. But maybe it's sometimes there's a, a part of the book where I talk about this month long insomnia that nothing cured, nothing. I mean, I did all kinds of things to myself to try to sleep. And then I remembered the poems I used to write when I was younger. 
and I calmed the fear in my life, this beating heart that just felt like it was going to dagger me to death. I, I, I found that I could go in my own life towards calm by arranging lines on a page, by thinking of new sounds and combining them in a certain way. So it's a great question. I knew you were gonna ask me questions that I just never have been asked before and I've never really thought about, but that's my best answer for the moment, just in the Barrett. I feel like it does, I mean, that makes sense to write with fear or with questions or with uncertainty. I mean, that the, the writing is then alive in the question and the space between the answer that you don't yet know, which I think probably you told me somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is a defining principle of my teaching. <laughs> um, I wondered about, um, formatting the book like this, the structure, the form. And um, I wonder if you, with this book, took a long time to find this form, this structure, or it came from having written essays that were then published that you started to see a through line. Another great question. Um, this book, and I, I write about the making of this book at the end yeah. of the book. Um, I this book was a complete failure as almost all my books are for the first many, many drafts. And I know I have some pen students who are listening and watching and therefore embrace what doesn't work. Just do, it will get you somewhere. Um, I thought about uh, using this book first as a, you know, as a journey, then as a search for meaning. Um, and yes, I had begun in 2018 after many, many years of writing fiction for younger readers and essays for the Philadelphia Inquirer, um, I had begun to publish a small essays. Um, I never did a count of how many essays had been previously published, but most of the work in here is new. But what I, I realized as I wrote, um, and there's one essay in here where, you know, the, the idea of apostrophe, apostrophe life, and there is a phrase, wife, daughter, self in the book, I finally realized what I was trying to do. I was trying to get to some kind of iterative understanding of self because of, of course, self is not a singular. We are Walt Whitman's multitudes. Um, and then I had to find the rhythms of the book. Okay, so now I'm going to segregate this into wife, daughter, self somehow. But am I going to just plot these up? This is about being a wife. I'll put them in this section. This um, That didn't work. That wasn't going to work. Um, and so there was a lot of me thinking about the choreography of the book, the, the way the white space worked in the book, the highs and the lows and the short and the longs of the book, the urgencies and the calm of the book. And a lot of that is just intuitive. And my wonderful editor, Laura Stanfill of, of Forest Avenue Press gave me the freedom after we thought the book was pretty much done for me to pull six or seven essays out of the book because I just didn't like them. They weren't working and to write new ones because I'd finally established the sound and the patterning and the pacing. And now I needed the work that fit that. That's interesting. Okay. Um, this is a bit of a funny one, maybe. Ah, oh no. It's not ha ha funny, it's just strange. Um, so it's just, I think strange from my perspective that I found it, but um, so th there are many references to rules I noticed. Oh. Um, you write that you attempted fastidious obedience to the rules in one yeah. section. Um, in another, you say, I play by the rules of the game. I stay inside my lane. And there were eight references in total. And I- Oh, you're I, kidding me. You counted I, that? You could but, but I also went back and I and I had read some of your earlier work and I read a piece in the New York Times where you mentioned something about rules again. It, like, you, it was like 20 years ago. And you said, um, you can learn the rules of framing form and voice but rules do not make stories. You were writing about writing, obviously. Yeah. But um, I wondered about your attitude to rules as a teacher and as a writer, and if it, they're different. 
Well, you teach so much. And so. I do. It's a great, great question. I cannot believe you counted the number of rules. I, 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 I worry about what else you might have counted. It is a book that has purposeful repetition. Just no, no, I know. I know. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> No, but I, I, I repeat it to say that, like, I think that, that it's, it's thematic. Well, it's absolutely, yes, it's yeah. true. I love the question. And um, I should say a, a bit of self-revealing that I grew up with a lot of rules. Um, my name is Beth. I was told very early on that it meant house of God. And I felt um, the great need to be this perfect kid don't break any rules, don't do anything that would upset anybody. Um, and I did abide. And so I feel as if, as, an, as, a, as a writer who's learned how to become a writer, I started out by looking for patterns or rules or, or you know, so what am I gonna grab onto as a writer? Um, who's gonna teach me the rules? And so as I began to learn and to write and to, to, to experiment and to fail, um, I began to develop my own body of understanding of what makes for wonderful work. And that isn't necessarily a series of rules, but it is a um, kind of, some, I, I feel like it's a substance. Um, and and I, I wrote Handling the Truth, where I made some statements about what memoir is, and then I kept reading more and more memoir, and then I kept experimenting a little bit, and my students started to teach me, and the great Jacinda would ask me these questions that I'd have to be like, oh my gosh, I have to think about that. She might have me breaking my rules here, until I began to um, understand um, that there are principles of worthy and ways to get at meaning. Um, but what's exciting is breaking the known rules. I have a friend, Jean, who wrote to me just today. She started to read the book and she said, you have dared yourself to break the rules. And I have. I haven't written a traditional memoir. I shattered the life and I put it into a memoir and essay. That's beautiful. Um, can I ask about, we were talking before we went on about some of the talisman and lovely yeah. gifts you are wearing and carrying tonight. Yeah, thank you for Something asking. Something from that. your father, the last gift he gave you. Yeah, so um, my father always came to all of my, um, all my readings and my parties. We'd have a cake, he would come. He would always be the most popular person in the room. Um, and the last thing he gave me was this necklace, um, which was a few years ago. Um, and so I'm wearing that. The jacket I'm wearing is something my husband gave me for my birthday. The wall that I'm sitting be be before is a drawing that my husband made on chalkboard. My editor had these little, little tiny versions, Laura. Stanville had these little tiny versions of the book. My friend Susan made me these earrings and my friend Katrina took French linen and 1870s quilt fabric and buttons and French knots and she created a wife daughter self. And the reason that I was talking about this when we were just chatting before is that sometimes launching a book or creating a book feels like a lonely thing. And my dear friends know that I've been anxious as this book came into the world. And the anxiety broke when I realized that um, what's inside the book is love and what surrounds me is love. And I will likely never be a famous commercial best-selling author, but I think that I am really lucky. And these talismans remind me of that. You being here with me, Jacinda, reminds me of that. How blessed I am to be able to write and to share my stories with people I love. And then they love me back with these things. So um, I wanted to ask you about um, this. You have a one sentence essay in the book. Mm -hmm. titled, Why I Never Learned to Speak Your Language. And the essay answers with, because I have hardly learned to speak my own. 
I wondered if you could elaborate on that answer because we obviously all know that you are an extraordinary writer <laughs> and, and language, you, you do have a masterful grasp of the language and why, because there's a lot of references to your husband's language, why that is so significant and important to you learning to speak it. Yeah. So thank you for the question. And my husband's Salvadoran and he is bilingual, grew up speaking both Spanish and English at the same time. Um, his father spoke English, his mother spoke Spanish. Um, and throughout the book, there is there are these little pieces, not just in wife, but later on in the book, as you say, where I'm saying why I never learned to speak my husband's language. And the first time I answer, it's because I was a child lisper and because, you know, basically I struggle with language. And, and each time the question is presented, I have a different answer, which is, which is part of defining self. Um, when we answer the same question in different ways, does it mean we didn't understand the first time, that we're evolving in our understanding, that we're lying, that anything is true? What does it mean? And why is there always a shifting response? By the time it gets to that final single sentence, you know, um, because I've hardly learned, um, I do love language and I do love the musicality of words on the page, um, but I am still struggling every time I set out to write anything at all um, to have the sense that I know what I'm doing. I got this. Um, and actually, I think that's a really good thing. I think it's really important to struggle on the page, to be uncertain, to not feel like you own language or that language necessarily owns you. Um, and I think it is only because I don't believe I've got it yet that I'm still motivated to write and still hopefully going to write better things. You're in the act of becoming always. Yes, always. Um, so you, you write so beautifully about your father and the changing dynamic from being cared for as a child to being the caregiver. And, um, and I know that you've lost your, your dad in, these, in this time. And he, I was wondering if he was able to see the work, if you mm -hmm. shared it with him. Um, my father was the great caregiver. He spent his life making sure his wife and three children had everything they needed and he couldn't give up work. You know, he kept consulting in his 80s. Um, and so, yes, a lot of this book is, is sort of this flipping of caring, of being cared for and caring of um, one of the ways I hope that I've cared for him is to write honestly about him. Um, and every relationship is complicated and complex. And so the complexities are here in the book. He does know, he did know that I was working on the book. It's part of the book where I talk about that. Um, he may have read two essays, the one that originally appeared in the Pennsylvania Gazette where I talk about how everybody says I look just like my father and I am just like my father. My father and I both went to Penn um, or wherever I would go and that you must be Beth Kephart because you know I look just like him. Um, so I, he knew this book was happening. He told me he thought it was an important project. There are um, pieces of this that I truly wish he could have read. Um, and I will say that one of the things about my father passing away is that he continues on in my friendships with Claire, who was his aide during the fa last few months of his life. I just talk, took a walk with Susan Sandler, who was his doctor. We took a two hour walk the other day in my neighborhood. Um, and I, I was just on the phone with one of with my father's um, fraternity brother from Penn, um, who was telling me the stories of his life. And I received uh, these hundred letters about my father after he passed away. So I feel as if he is carrying forward, I'm carrying him forward. And he, I hope would have loved this book although he was very modest and probably wouldn't have wanted the, the limelight. But he gave me the freedom to write it, he did. That's extraordinary. Um, 
you know, that I mean, that makes me think about I mean, your affection for the people that you write about is so evident in your work. And um, I always remember how important it was for you. This is this is how I this is how I took in your teaching. So if I reflect it back to you and it's different to you, let me know. But <laughs> but that um it was it was always as important for us to be as kind as truthful and to never to um take more than you give when you're writing and it, you, your your sense of like um how you handle the other on the page was part of the integrity of the writer um is that how you feel about your work and about the process of writing memoir where you really take other people's lives and and bring them into you know your choice to write the book it is always the most difficult question I'm asked as a teacher of memoir about, well, how do we deal with the other on the page? Mm -hmm. How do we develop their character? How do, we, how do we speak honestly of how we feel about them and the nature of a relationship without hurting them? Um, from very, very early on within my early books, uh, I was uh, enormously aware that the writer claims the space of the story, the writer claims the, the, the making of the character of the other. And yes, I have worked really hard to understand how we can be kind and whole and also honest. Um, I think in early books, I was um, um, less inclined to go into the difficult material because I just was always putting first what, you know, how will that person respond? How will that make them feel? I found that if we put somebody fully in three dimensions, they will feel, as one of my students said to me recently, they will feel seen. Um, and, um, and I think it's important in our pages to allow the other person to feel seen, to never use our writing as retribution. Um, to never, as I say in Handling the Truth, it's writing memoir is not a big take that in prose. Um, we have to have the right reasons for writing. And if we have them, the courtesy will naturally spring forth. Um, you, you, um, there's a line, I was just, seeing where oh so I always I know how much you love questions and what a big question asker you are and you talk about questions in the book um but you also write that you learn to ask small questions only small ones of your husband and I wondered how you how one reconciles that how a, a question asker reconciles asking just the small questions well from, or, one, or, from one question asker to another my dear Jacinda um, well, Unless that, that is oblique and you meant something a little bit different by that, so. Uh, I will just answer that at the face value of the question. Um, my husband is an artist um, and uh, he is someone who has very big, fantastical, as I use the word, uh, stories to tell, um, but he's also someone who really likes quiet. And the, the worst thing that I could do to the marriage would be to uh, pummel him with questions about what he did that day or what were you thinking? Or um, just as with the writing process where I talk about taking things from that sideways, if you can't get at it one way, go at it from sideways. I think the way to get to know my husband is to look at his art and to look at him in quiet and to um, a, a big question for my husband would be a frontal attack. So, so, so we learn those things over marriage. My husband's like that too. <laughs> my dad was like that too. Maybe it's a guy thing. Um, and it, well, and also I think learning to, um, Rachel Cusk had a great essay about getting remarried and her husband uh, and learning to abide and to love the silence and the quiet and not see it as empty, but realize how full the quiet spaces can be. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you, wrote, you wrote of um, needing to lie as a child and how, and I was thinking, is this, is this, do you believe that's a very common trait for a lot of artists and why then they perhaps go on to create 
lies of the, the fictional world, you know, fictional alter alternatives to reality, that, Im that impulse. Yeah, I think the impulse for me, it became um, the, the, the little perfect Beth and her bobby socks and everything felt really boring. And so she began to, as I speak sometimes of myself in third person now and in the book, um, I began to lie uh, about the stupidest little things like not big things at all. Just um, if a boy had done okay. something for me, I multiplied it by it by tens, you know? Um, crazy. I mean, you know, why not? Because it got the attention, right. you know, I'm a middle child. My brother is brilliant. You know, my sister was the youngest. I'm in the middle. I got something to say. I'll just, I'll just, I'll just build it up a notch for two or 10, you know? But um I think that, yeah, you know, from nine years old, I was writing um, very, very bad poems. Um, and um, my impulse was always towards truth. Um, I did write a lot of short stories and I have published a lot of fiction, but I think it's, this is a weird thing. I've never tried to articulate it. Um, I try to write my truth, my essays, my memoir stuff, with as much velocity and saturation um, and vivid, you know, as possible um, without ever lying. So I think my early days of lying and a lot of my practice with fiction has gotten me to a place with memoir where it is as rich as it can be and still the truth. So to answer your broader question, I do imagine that a lot of artists in any field, um, and maybe just all of us as a kid felt the need to lie to just get a little bit more attention. And then some of us learned to like it and to cultivate it and to turn it into art. Turn into art, that's right. Um, I wondered if you might read just from the, uh, the end of your book in the, on the making of wife of yourself. I will read the last, um, half of the la I would read half of the last page where I'm trying to talk I, I am talking about how the book came together because the book is I want to say a meta reflection not just on a life but how a life gets made on the page so there's a lot about making memoir as I write and I wanted to expand on that in the end if we were out on the ice I would skate you this book if you asked about my process I'd say music if you asked for a more scientific explanation, I would say that the aggregation of parts that constitute this memoir reflect my belief, belief that truth is not continuous, that stories live in scenes, that we remember in bursts and find wisdom in the juxtaposed, that writing the same story twice is to puzzle out dimensions, that we must follow the telling details through fog and mist, that sometimes we are the teacher, but mostly we're the student. The memoir built of parts says yes. We'll never get it perfectly right. The truth is in the trying. The truth is there in the cracks in the ice. The truth is there inside the music. Some of my parts still smear. Some of my lines remain broken. Sometimes I exasperate, defend, plead, wish, want, yearn, jump and fall, spin and scratch, annoy you. But that's the journey memoir takes us all on. That's the form of us on the page. Beautiful. I can't not move when I read. I know. It's like, <laughs> it's like all inside me. It is the marrow. I, I love that you write about these identities that we as women um, historically have been sometimes primarily identified with um, and that you put self last because sometimes that is the nature of what we do. And I wonder if you thought about, I know you've written about motherhood before, but if there was ever an idea to include that third. Me as mother. Um, yeah, that external is, eye on that. Yeah, there are two. We, Bill and I, have an extraordinary son, and uh, that will make me cry too. Um, and there is a really important, there are two places in the book where Jeremy surfaces, one in a piece I call Call, where I lose him, we lose him in Longwood Gardens, 
um, in, in the Venice Biennale. We managed to lose our poor son twice. Um, and then there is his own essay where I am as self doubting whether I had been um, a good enough, strong enough, right enough mother. Um, and Jeremy in his beautiful way assures me, um, you know, mom, you can't give me happiness. You can give me love and you have loved me. Um, and I felt that that said everything, those few pages says, says everything there is about my relationship to my son and also my relationship to my own mothering. My own mothering, I'm uncertain, I wish I'd done it better. My, my son is so beautiful and so wonderful and no matter what I did, he turned out to be this great person he is. So he also has got a great dad, so that probably had a big role. Um, but um, there's enough of me as mother in here. That makes sense. My last question before we pass it over to some people in the audience, hopefully that have some great questions, um, is just, we, we spoke before this conversation, we had a long conversation and we, we spoke about your feelings about memoir before writing this and publishing this and how you were unsure if you wanted to return to memoir as you had begun with memoir and you, um, or, or not totally begun, but in your earlier yeah. stages. Yeah. Um, and that uh, being a teacher for so long and having many other identities that you had felt like maybe it was time to leave that to your students. Yeah. And, um, and I wondered now, the book is complete. It's gonna be going into the world. How did, what is your relationship to memoir for yourself? Do you think you'd like to write more? Do you feel like it's, it's yours again? I can't ever own it. I don't think any of us can, but I don't think I can stop. I've written so many essays, some of them craft, some of them personal. Um, and the reason why I don't think we can or should um, stop writing memoir is because we use this as a way to get to know ourselves. And as we keep refining the sense of who we are, I don't know who I am unless I'm writing. We also, as I have been telling my students at Penn the last few weeks, we um, get to understand who we can be with others, what we can contribute to others. Um, the, the better we know our iterative many selves, um, the better we, we can be uh, with others. One of the fears you and I talked about was, oh my gosh, here I am. I published five memoirs early on, then I published all these other kinds of books. Here I, here I am a teacher. What if this book fails? What if people say, well, this, this doesn't work. Will that strip me of my right to teach? So there was a great um, huh, risk taken with this book. And uh, and I decided um, if I'm gonna take the risk, I'm just gonna write the riskiest book there is and take the consequences. It's gonna be well-received. It's already being well-received. <laughs> I've seen a few little people writing um, things online about it, writing beautiful reviews. So. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. So, thank you. First of all, thank you both so much. Uh, thank you for that great, um, for the great book. And thank you for those very thoughtful, excellent questions, Jacinda. Um, so let's try to get to as many of these as possible. Um, there are 19. So uh, folks at home, we're just giving priority. I'm just going down the list here. So if we'd known, uh, and you spoke about this a little bit, if we'd known uh, little child Beth, uh, what would we have seen that would show us uh, you were going to be a writer? Uh, that I would sit I would take these blank books and I would take um, watercolor and lots, way too much water and way too fat brushes. And I would um, sit and paint those pages so that they had color. And then I would write in my big fat, awful handwriting, these awful poems. But I thought that I was doing something important, but that is just one piece of it. The other piece of it was that I was a skater. And I do not think that I would be a writer had I not been a skater. And it's, I have my father to thank for giving me the, um, the lessons and the time with, with skates. And um, because so much of writing for me is about the choreography. And um, I think that I overcame my 
disastrous use of language early on because I still had a sense for what the, what the sound of a story could be. If I didn't have the story yet, I still had a sense for what the sound could be. So I don't think you can take away the skater bath from the girl who wrote the poems underneath the tree about Zeus in sonnet form, of course, because that's the only way to write a poem when you're 11 years old. Right. Um, quickly, just into while we have you, how did you come into writing? Um, is that something you always did as well? Um, yeah, I was always writing and reading along the way when I was traveling and working. I mean, I left uh, my hometown when I was 17 and um, I found my way to books later in life. It, it was at 18 when I started reading um, intensively. So I was writing along the way and then um, actually I had a, um, an illness which like sort of took me out of life for a little bit for like six months. And that was really the catalyst for me having the space to read and write. And that's when I started diving into it. And then in the subsequent years, I started like, you know, take going to do workshops and mm -hmm. like working with Beth and so that kind of stuff. So yeah. I, I would like to add to that, um, that Jacinda is the kind of person that will go to the Strand bookstore and find the most exciting titles and, um, and, and, and send a text or talk to me about it. She, the level of reading um, and search, and she's always got some great thing that she's watched or some, something important. Um, I've never seen anyone so capable of curiosity and so capable of chasing the curiosity she has with the things that will answer her questions. A lot of that is books. Um, and, then, and then she's able to translate it gorgeously onto the page for, of her own very interesting stories. Excellent, thank you. We're a library, we have that. These are questions. I was just gonna say about library, thank God for bookstores and thank God for libraries. And we, we, miss, we miss all of you <laughs> in these times. We're going to use that quote in our promotional reel. All right. Um, so uh, speaking of which, I, I can answer this one. Does the Free Library have a copy of the book? Uh, this is from Valerie. Valerie, email us at author events at freelibrary.org uh, and we can we can send you a link to our circulation desk and they can answer that. It's already checked out. I, I it's, already, look, okay. it's already checked out. Okay. <laughs> um, so this question is from Hillary Morgan. How do you start writing a memoir slash creative nonfiction piece you've been trying to start for years? especially when the subject you're interacting with is no longer with us. I know Hillary and I know what she's referring to there. Um, and um, there's a great power in photographs. And um, what I have thought about lately, especially teaching this semester to my 17 amazing students at Penn, um, is the, I keep thinking about um, how we need to exploit the materials we do have, especially at this time where it's hard to get out and travel and see our old homes and that sort of thing. Um, and so I look towards old photographs, or I would suggest, Hillary, that you look towards old photographs and begin to simply write the scenes that, that, that build from them and to not try to think, what order am I writing this in? Where do I place this? Um, but to just begin to create postcards of remembered moments. And it is, it, it is never, never, never to start a project with, I am writing a book. That's gonna kill you every time. I have a photograph in my hand and I'm going to try to evoke a particular scene. There's language, there's my voice, there's a tone. What do I do with it with a second photograph? What's the relationship? Where's the white space? What do the juxtapositions tell me? Can I say, I, I was listening to Jeanette Winterson talk about how she starts her books and she calls it a magpie approach. She just has desks laid out where she just writes scenes, no pages, no order, no nothing, just pieces and starts building it. And I thought, and I know, and I have another friend who won't even dare call it a book when they start, wouldn't even yeah. use the word. Yeah, yeah definitely. See, I want all other questions to go directly to Jacinda. Oh. Yes. <laughs> Let me jump in on these. Um, so this one is from uh, Ruta uh, Sepitas. I, I want to get that right. I'm sorry. Uh, Beth, you have many of your adoring students here tonight, myself included. 
Uh, over the years, you have spoken and taught us to identify and respect the multitudes within us. Uh, in organizing Wife, Daughter, Self, how did you go about sorting through the multitudes within yourself? What to include and what not to include? How to select or, or abandon a memory? Oh, Ruta, another incredibly brilliant writer, friend, um, daughter. We learned a lot about being daughters together. Um, that's such a complex question, and Ruta knows I've been working on an essay about that very thing. Um, and um, I think the great discovery in the book, and all discoveries seem obvious and as you try to phrase them, but in the moment they feel like, wow, um, is that every time I thought I landed on a self, um, it wasn't the self. I wasn't just a writer. I wasn't just a daughter. I wasn't just, you know, all of these things. There's a big, long essay in the book called The Apostrophe Wife, where I um, think, well, you know, I, I can't figure out myself. So maybe if I try to figure out Henriette Wyatt, who kind of shares a lot of things with me, um, if I figure her out, then I will have figured me out. And that doesn't even work. So how do we sort and we, how do we sift the many selves we are? I think what we do, Ruta, now that you forced me to try to articulate this in your way, um, I think that what we do um, is reveal our path towards the search. Um, this might fit, no, it doesn't. This is who I think I am, but maybe not quite. What does that search look like? Um, and it's, it's making that search coherent um, that um, allows us ultimately to choose which selves, which stories we put inside a book. It's a great question, of course. Um, this question is from Kathy Lentis. Uh, can you elaborate on finding the sound of the work? What do you mean by this? I'm interested in that. Oh, but you have sound. You have, okay. you have so much you sound. Think, yeah. Um, Kathy, I remember you reading a sentence out loud in a workshop not long ago, and it was full of sound, this long metaphorical storm. Um, and I, there's the soft, there's the hard, there's the urgent, there's the receding. Um, and our syllable, the syllables that we choose tell us a lot about where we are emotionally in relationship to our stories. Um, I think that reading something out loud is after the seventh or eighth or ninth draft, um, the way that I know um, if the sound is working or not. And, if, and most of the time, if the sound isn't working, at least for me, the story is not working either. Um, and so I think it's, where do you pause? Where do you rush? Um, where do you chase? Where do you stop? Your punctuation tells you that. Your vowels, your soft and your heart, all of that tells you that. Um, and I think it's intuitive, but I think we know when we get there. Thank you. Um, this one comes from Sarah Beth West. Um, I never, when I've read questions before, did I presume that the author knew the question asker so much as I do tonight. Too. Yeah, I do. No, I like, her. she's yeah, amazing. I, like, I see you light up. Every, uh, so Sarah Beth West asks, every writer evolves, of course. So what changes have you seen in your writing over the years? And what do you, uh, what do you think has remained uh, constant? The musicality, even when I didn't have a story to pin it to has been the constant. Um, the uh, change has been the willingness to take more and more risks, both with story and structure. Um, my last novel for younger readers was, which Sarah Beth uh, wrote an amazing review of. Um, it was the most risky novel I wrote and probably would be the last one that I write, um, Wife, Daughter, Self is certainly a risk. There isn't another book that really looks like this um, and or sounds or is compiled like this. So I think I'm more willing to take risks. I think I trust myself more. Um, and I think you see that both in the language, in the choice of the story and scene and in the structure. Thank you. Um, so Derek 
uh, Plantagenet uh, asks, it seems your struggle with language became a lifelong passion. Does that struggle add value uh, to, uh, to your life in writing? Yeah. Anything that's easy is going to look and feel easy. If you're not struggling with your own life, if you're writing memoir on the page, um, then you're, and then there's a sort of arrogance, I think, right? I know my life. Why don't you know yours? Yeah, I got it all. I package it. Um, so yeah, because I struggle, I think it's harder for my friends. <laughs> my struggle is hard because, you know, they get the, they get the up and the down and the blue and the, and the peach of me, you know? Um, but I'm always struggling every day. Jacinda, I don't know, is it like this for you to, am I using my time right? Have I spent my words right? Should I just be sitting in the sun and reading or should I be in my room? I mean, how do you feel about that? Same. It's always a negotiation, especially in this phase of life, but I think for everybody it is, you know. I I don't, yeah. don't you think struggle, struggle constitutes sort of the possibility of goodness in the work? Yeah, I mean, I don't know that you could do any kind of writing or any kind of artistic endeavor without the struggle. I don't even understand how it would exist. I guess, I guess maybe it does, but like in that friction and in that sort of juxtaposition of opposing forces is where energy often lies. Yeah, exactly. See, Jacinda is going to be your next. She's just going to do an hour alone. Oh no, we're 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 oh, okay. wait, we're waiting for it. Well, and I, I guess that's a question for both of you, sort of writing wise. I, I yeah, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but do you see that as a two way street? Also, do you see that as your writing informing you know the choices you make in your life? And and the, so I mean, can you talk about that really quick? Like how. You know, it's easy to say our life influences our writing, but but does it go the other direction as well? Jacinda, do you want to go first? Well, it goes, it always goes in the other direction too, because you're, as Beth, you know, said, as Virginia Woolf said, as so many writers have said, you know, you write to find out what you, what you think. So naturally the writing informs your thinking, which therefore informs your choices. So like, I mean, and, and like they always say, you know, the writing advice is never to write something until it's finished, not when you're inside of it. But I do write things when I'm inside of it. And um, so I can imagine in that way, it definitely informs what happens. Um, and it definitely informs the narrative you hold in your head about it, events. Um, and that affects everything, it affects who you think you are, it affects how you, know, how you identify. Like, so, so yeah, what do you think, Beth? I think, Absolutely. Sometimes it's the, 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 all of my books are deeply researched. This book, as I said, Henriette Wyeth, my husband and I get in the car and we drive halfway across the country so we can see Henriette Wyeth's home. Is that the longest piece in the book? I'm sorry. It, to it, it, I, you know, I don't know word count, but it's no, between, no between that and the, and the establishing of the workshop, the farm, the, the decision yeah. we make to change our lives. Um, so yeah, sometimes the research just takes us to a place and then life happens and then you try to capture it. Um, but also I think our relationship to being writers has a lot to do with how we feel and we're not actually writing. Um, as many people know, I've been making all these blank books in this very room um, because I've felt empty um, and, and so that's a choice I've made. Also, it's my husband being the artist, always making things with his hands. It's this opportunity I've had to see what happens when I don't need words to express myself. Um, and that is, that is a life choice, this making of things that comes out of being a writer, maybe a taxed and exhausted writer. Um, so we have a, a question from Jessica Gilkison. Uh, Beth, would you talk more about your collaborations with your husband? Ah, oh, Jess. Um, hello, Jess. Jess was with us on the farm and in Frenchtown. Um, my whole life is a collaboration with Bill. Every minute is a collaboration with Bill. Um, but also, of course, he illustrated this book. 
the flowers on the cover are his. Gigi Little did the wonderful design with Lara. They did so many different versions. Um, Bill has illustrated a number of my young adult books, um, but there's also the collaboration of, and it's more subtle, of me watching him work, learning from the way he works. Uh, he is the one that's trying to figure out how to, how to turn this little machine into a letterpress so the blank books are not, no longer blank. Um, he's the one that built the room I'm sitting in. Um, so there is no Beth without Bill. I wondered, Beth, about that idea of like, when I was reading the way that you have influenced each other over the years, and I wondered if he has influenced your prose. And you, you and I used it when I talked about your book, when I, I, when I said, like, whittled down, I can't remember what I said exactly, but like one of your husband's pragmatics, I can't remember, vases. And, and like, I wondered if your approach to your prose is ever affected by some of his pieces in that. Your term was, her stories are bare, stripped down, whittled to their very essence, like one of her husband's dark pragmatic vessels. Is that a sentence? That's a fantastic sentence. Um, so the question is whether he has influenced my prose. He's not a big reader of my work. He's listening. He knows that's true. Um, you know how he, he cuts through the BS. If I, because I will read aloud some of the stuff I'm doing and, and if he's bored, it's very clear. Um, and I think, I think um, Bill has influenced me to get to the point quicker. I think that's that's something, but, but the way the sentences are. Five minutes, make your case in five minutes. Yes, make your case in five minutes or a whole book, choose one or the other. Borrow, I got to borrow that one. That one's good. I got to give that to my mom. <laughs> yeah, right. I think Bill will get, let you give that to your mom when you next speak to your mom. <laughs> um, yeah, I love the idea of the elevator pitch to sell your book in five minutes. Um, we're not going to get to all of them. I want to get to a few that I thought were pretty intriguing. They're all actually terrific questions. So thank you, everybody. And I'll try to shout out everyone so that, that you will know that everyone that you know has, <laughs> has come in to ask you a question. But uh, I'm sure this person knows you, Betty Jean Steinshauer, oh, wow. because yeah. she says, hi, Bethy. Uh, <laughs> thank you for all that you've taught me over the years. Uh, and this was, this was something I was wondering about too. I wonder if uh, you know yet uh, what this pandemic has taught you. Uh, are you going to try and write about it? Are you going to avoid it? How, how are you going to fold it in uh -huh. to, you know, to your work? Betty Jean is someone I met, I think the very, I was working with Floyd Skloot and Rebecca Skloot and we had, and Dinty Moore and Lee Gutkind um, and Susan Orleans. And we were down at uh, a college in, in Maryland and she was with Patty Smith. There were others there that are still in my life today. I have written about the silence and the pandemic. Um, I've written about distance. I've taken historic characters. I'd like to do research, as I said, and um, thought about how they've dealt with silence or with suppressed desire. Um, but I also spent a lot of time, especially after my father passed away, just living the silence of the pandemic. Um, there's a lot that the pandemic has done to all of us. There's also a lot that we can take from it. And I remember one of our more recent conversations with Jacinda, I was telling her that for a month, I decided I would call each one of a different friend each day and take a long walk with them on the phone. And Katrina, you know, is one of those people. And, um, and our friendship has grown stronger, you know, a long walk with, with Robin Black or, you know, it, there are people that I've always known I really loved and um, something about this has given us more time together. So there is that. And I write about those things. I have been writing about those things. Yeah. Jacinda, what about you? <laughs> we're, we're at a year now. I was, I was foot on the plane almost ready to go on a year of travel when this happened so um i it is it has brought me into like 
shocking confrontation with stillness and and not being able to to go and move and I've spent a lifetime traveling so um so that this is the longest I have ever 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 been in one place in my in my life since I left home at 17. so um yes I I've been writing about it I think I'm still too, too inside of it but um yes I think none of us will come out of this not changed in some way and hopefully for the better in that it slows us down enough to see a little bit better, see what's around us, see other people, see what we, you know, overlook to see it, you know, Beth was talking about the kindness to, to approach people with kindness. Like I, I really do hope that a lot of good comes out of this. Um, I, 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 oh, I know we're at, we're at 8.33. So well, I, I have one more question for okay. you both, but, but go ahead. No, but go ahead, go ahead. I was just going to say uh, that uh, Jacinda and I were just talking the other night, as she said, and uh, as much as she is the traveler, I mean, the, the, the places they go, the things they see, um, and she's always writing about those things, you know, in journals. Um, but I also sense, Jacinda, that you have created, you talked about this the other night, a a stronger well around you where you can write for longer periods of time and your process you said is changing. So it has affected you as a writer. Yes, that's true. Especially yeah. travel writers. I, I, I was thinking about travel writers during all of this the other day, like what do you even yeah. do? Um, I, I just wanna give people, I have, there was one question I wanted to ask, but uh, just so people can uh, know that, that you were here and uh, so you know they were here, uh, Steve, Durasmo says, uh, uh, your parents, Bill and Jeremy, must be oozing, oozing with uh, love and pride for you. Um, uh, Sharon. My high school friend, Steve. November asked a question. Oh, Sharon. Uh, uh, Giswaldo Brimfield says, will Jacinda be back to interview other uh, authors at the library? We certainly <laughs> hope so. Um, there you go. <laughs> Kelly Simmons asked a question. Annie Schull asked a question. Actually, she says, not a question. Beth, just thank you. You've given so much to all of us. Oh. Uh, Mario Suet uh, asked brother. a question. Jennifer Hubbard, uh -huh. Rosenberg. Yeah, I think I, I think I hit everybody. And I was going to do one last question okay. um, because we are sort of at the beginning of, if I can find it again, there we go. We are sort of the, uh, at the beginning of Women's History Month. Um, and Barbara Schmidt asks, and, and uh, uh, Jacinda, if you want to go first, and then Beth to close out our evening, what women's writers inspired your work? Did any of your pen teachers who were writers uh, inspire that in you? Maybe not your pen <laughs> uh, authors, but Jacinda, can, can you talk about that briefly? Um, I love Rachel Cusk and Virginia Woolf and Jeanette Winterson and Beth and um, there are, you know, whenever you're put on the spot, it's like always hard to think of. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, Elizabeth Hardwick, uh, I, I like um, Marguerite Duras. I liked, I liked uh, different writers for different reasons, but I, I have been profoundly influenced by extraordinary female writers. Jacinda is the person who says, hey, Read Elizabeth Hardwick, and I do, and I fall in love. Um, there's a Helen Garner essay that's been remarkably effective. It, it has had an impact on me. Carolyn Forche's early work, Chloe Hunnam's poems, um, the uh, Alice McDermott's tremendous novels talk about a woman who contains and controls sound. Um, there are and of course, I spent the last few years studying and writing about Virginia Woolf. I have a number of essays out about that, her. Um, and so uh, I, Annie Dillard, yeah, I mean, every time I teach a juncture workshop, there's probably 16 to 20 excerpts and, you know, many of them are women. So my shelves are full. There's so much to learn from so many different writers, men and women. Mm -hmm. Well, there we go. Um, what a nice way to end. So first of all, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in with us. We had a great big audience tonight. Um, and I'm sure there are people from all over uh, who, who love your work, but I, you always have a strong Philly showing as well. Jacinda, thank you so much. Um, we look forward to having you as, as an author, certainly hopefully as an interviewer again, it was terrific. 
Um, thank, thank you. Very you. Much. I just want to say one last thing. You know, Borges says that the um, uh, heaven is likely. You know, that is it. Heaven or is likely a or paradise is likely a library. He has like some quote like that. And I feel like for a lot of us and probably a lot of the people listening that they imagine like paradise is a library. And I just wanna say thank you to, to all of you, every, every library across this country and across the world that is keeping that paradise alive for all of us to return to. Can I just echo that? Um, my time at the free library, every time has been has been magic, whether I've been there to research or there to talk to others, um, just walking there, boy, do I miss being able to walk in there um, and to see those photographs in your green room and the books and, the, and the, all the centennial material you have and the maps and the photographs and everything that you have. Um, we can't wait till you're open again. We love the libraries, we love the bookstores, um, we are, we love the indie presses that put out books like Wife, Daughter, Self, Laura Stanfield at Forest Avenue Press. So um, and the indie we're, we're grateful. We're grateful people. Well, and so. we're grateful for, uh, to you all too. So thank you so much. And, you know, knock on wood, we're turning a corner and we'll be able to have you at the library for the next one, I'm sure. And I'm just going to say one last thing. When Jacinda's book comes out, I get to interview her. All right. Oh. No one else. I know there's going to be a really long line, but it's me. Deal. It's, it's deal. a verbal contract. Yep. Okay. This, was, this is recorded, so um, <laughs> we got it down. All right. Thank you all so much. Thank good night, you. everyone at home. Thank uh, you. Good night, Jacinda. Good night, Beth. Thank you again. Thank you. And, thank you. Uh, yeah. Let's do it again Jacinda, next time. Jacinda, right. thank you. Thank you. So cool to see you. <laughs>